Hey everyone, welcome to the Age of Influence series. We're glad to have you here today. Uh, today we're going to meet with Kara Burney from TrackMaven and get some insights into how they measure the ROI of organic influence. And she's also going to share some best practices tips for launching your own influencer marketing campaign. So first we'll go over some quick housekeeping. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can enter it in the uh, control panel at the bottom of your screen in the question section. And we'll also have a Q&A session at the very end where we'll get a chance to answer some of those questions. Well, we'll also be tracking hashtag Age of Influence on Twitter if you want to follow along there and ask any questions. So thanks, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to introduce Hillary, uh, our director of marketing here at Insightful. So Hillary, you want to take a second to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you, Bailey, for the introduction. Um, I am Hillary Settle, uh, Director of Marketing here at Insight Pool. Um, Insight Pool is a earned uh, influencer marketing platform. We help with um, audience uh, acquisition, um, fan engagement. Uh, we also help with you really getting a better idea on who your influencers are and uh, more characteristics about them. Um, so you're able to, to really identify um, your right audience learn about them, be smarter about how you activate them, um, and then once you're able to engage them, nurture those relationships and really help um, you know, build a full strategy around your influencer marketing campaign. Uh, now with over six million uh, influencers that now our, our customers have access to, it's, it's easier than ever to um, really have uh, uh, influencers be a key part of your, um, your marketing mix. So um, before we get started, I uh, wanted to introduce Kara Burney with TrackMaven, who's the director of content. Um, Kara, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Hillary. I'm, I'm excited to be here and uh, talk about some best practice for measuring organic influence today. Awesome. Well, we'd love to, to hear a little bit more about you and TrackMaven before we get started. Sure thing. So uh, like, like Hillary mentioned, I, I head up the content marketing department here at TrackMaven. Uh, and I've been with a co company for uh, almost a full three years now. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C. and have been uh, since our inception. We're almost a four-year-old company now. Uh, and I think what is, is most interesting to me, and especially with the subject matter today, is, is how the role of content has really transitioned over into kind of blurring into the, the demand gen side of the business, especially if you're at a B2B business like we are here at TrackMaven. Uh, so I, I've been really excited to see kind of the the responsibilities and the scope of impact of content and influencer marketing, social media, all of these different marketing mixes uh, really expanded to really being valuable to the business, which is something we're going to be talking about uh, throughout, the, throughout the session today. But for those of you who may have never heard of TrackMaven before, our mission is really to make it as easy as possible for marketers to make more data-driven decisions. So for, for far too long, I think those of us in the marketing field, uh, we were used to maybe trust our guts, having creative flash of inspiration, throwing something out to market, and then you know being either surprised that it that it that it thrives or surprised that it flops. Uh, and so we want to eliminate kind of those surprises. Uh, and and the reason why, of course, is because if you have the right data, not just lots of data, but the right data, you can make smarter decisions with your your budget and really prove that marketing is valuable and has a major impact on the results that matter to your business. So that's a little bit about us. We are a marketing analytics platform uh, and reporting solution. We are, we're thrilled to work with, with marketing teams from hundreds of the world's best brands, really to help them prove that what they're doing matters and improve their results uh, with their business outcomes. So that's a little bit about us. Awesome. Well, great. Well, we're, we're really excited to have you here and uh, kind of giving us a different and unique perspective um, from your side. So to kind of kick it off, um, I know that earned influence has definitely been a hot topic, um, I'm sure for your team, Kara, as well. Um, and I think there's a little bit of uh, a lack of understanding around what actually earned influence looks like. Um, and what we'll, we'll kind of do is uh, we'll give uh, I'll give a bit of perspective from Insight Pool around what we kind of deem um, earned influence. And then Kara also definitely want to hear from the Track Maven perspective, you know, how, how you guys define earned influence. Um, to kind of give it a, a, a little bit more of a, a fun sort of imagery around it, um, kind of broke it out into two different sort of uh, fields, what paid influence is and then what earned influence is. Um, and, you know, when we look at, at paid influence, we also call that, you know, influencer advertising. So you see um, 
you know, the, the Kim Kardashians of the world, these, these high level VIP, um, influencers that come and, and are actually paid for their efforts. And now with, with a lot more regulations coming into place, um, they actually have to attribute, um, a hashtag, hashtag ad or hashtag promoted of some sort to actually identify that it is paid influence. Um, and, uh, lots of, lots of brands use, um, paid strategies, as part of their business. Um, however, what we're really seeing is that um, earned influence is something more than more than just a paid advertisement. It is um, brands really taking the time to uh, understand who their proper audience is to be engaging with, um, folks that really uh, care about what the brand has to say, what the brand has to offer, um, and then being really organic with that outreach, um, making it a conversation, um, getting them engaged in a way that feels authentic, um, and, and really building that r rapport to make it more of a relationship than just a paid um, transaction. Um, and that's, and, you know, from a social perspective and from um, the perspective of Insightful, that's really what, what we're seeing the difference is. Kara, I'd love for, for you to kind of give your um, ideas around what, what, you know, you would define earned influence as from, a, from your perspective. For sure. I think one of the things we've seen uh, at TrackHaven is one of the things that we have that, that's pretty cool is we do have tens of thousands of brands in our platform. So we're able to kind of analyze what is going on in the marketing state at large uh, just by surfacing a lot of what's going on with these brands across all these different industries. So we've done a lot of research around uh, kind of the declining impact uh, of a lot of branded content over the past several years. We've actually seen that uh, the amount of content that brands are creating on their social channels is going up. It went up 35% across the last year. But that influence and that impact of the content that brands are creating, it actually fell by 17% across, the, across the, the last year. So we've seen these kind of like, these, these, if you imagine a graph, these trends going in opposite directions where brands are pumping out more and more of their own content, but it's getting less and less influence. And I think one of the reasons is, is because we're just pushing too hard on our marketing messages. And so uh, why I'm so excited about this topic today is there are so many other conversations that as brands that we are competing with. And I think if you can really tap into the conversations that uh, are really attracting the pockets of audiences that you care about reaching, uh, if you really are aware of them and are able to tap into some of those conversations, you can really kind of percolate some conversations in a much more authentic way than, than if you're paying someone to, to tweet about you, which is just another form of spam, essentially. It might, might be influential, but as we'll get into later, I think there's a lot more effective ways to be authentic, really engage with the conversations and uh, the pockets of niche audiences that matter to your brand, uh, and just get that goodwill flowing from a more authentic place. Right. No, and definitely, you know, when we're talking about this sort of difference in, in social and content and making sure that you know, those also go hand in hand because if you, and I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, you have thoughts around this too, Kara, is if, you're, if you build an audience out that you think are super influential and then you know nothing about them and you share content that doesn't resonate, you're not going to get um, the kind of engagement that you're looking for because it's, you know, it's not targeted, it's not uh, relatable and, uh, and, you know, sort of that, that, Pray and, and, and pray idea isn't really working like it used to. Um, for sure, for sure. And I think too, I mean, more and more emphasis is on, there's a lot of pressure in marketing teams to prove their value. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of marketing teams are, are feeling the pressure because they're putting what, what could be great content, but they're putting it in front of the wrong people. And, and that can, can, can make your results look really, really dismal uh, and maybe cause you to change course unnecessarily. Whereas if you're really tapped into the right audience with the right pain points that you're trying to, to reach, uh, that content might strike a stronger chord. Yeah. No, definitely. And uh, and this slide and this slide really reflects that idea on, you know, being more authentic with your approach really does affect your results. Um, it might take more time and, and more effort than than paid does, you know, being more thoughtful about who your audience is, testing that um, A, B, testing the audiences, A, B, testing the content, uh, but being able to, you know, build a strategy that's more thoughtful on the way that you are able to earn this influence is really going to, to make a difference. And if you look at actually the, the charts we have here, it, it, I mean, it's powerful stuff. I mean, when we're looking at cost per lead and, you know, your click-through rate, right, when we're talking about these micro-influencers, which um, I'll break that down a little bit for you when we talk about 
the level of influence, um, there is a whole spectrum. Um, there are these VIP influencers, you know, your celebrities, your um, your major fashion uh, bloggers, um, all the way down to, you know, a friend of yours that's really involved with a yoga studio down the street from you that has influence within your neighborhood. Um, those micro influencers being able to target them, even if it's a smaller audience, um, being able to identify who they are, what their interests are, what the conversations they're having, and be able to either jump into those conversations, give them content that resonates with them, um, is is going to be a, a more fruitful result when you talk about um, being able to bring leads in that will actually convert for your business. So um, the the next sort of idea around this, and and you know when we were talking about um, being able to identify the audiences, I think this is a a key part of um, brand struggle. They they struggle to figure out not only the who, but where do I find the who, and how do I identify the right audience for for my business? Um, and that's where actually Insight Pool has really been able to help um, some of our our largest brands all the way down to some of our SMBs that are really trying to do more geolocated um, audiences around, um, you know, key topics. Um, and, you know, like I said, this is a top challenge for, for marketers, um, you know, with the change in um, ad blockers and, and being able to um, have to measure, as you said, Kara, measuring the, the metrics from a marketing standpoint being more challenging than ever. Um, we're seeing uh, marketers asking us, okay, I need to provide better numbers. I need to make sure that the efforts that I'm making to build this content piece, to do this event, um, that I'm actually targeting the right audience. Um, would you say, Kara, that these are some challenges that you that your team also sees marketers facing? Uh, absolutely, I, I, especially that measurement portion, which I think we'll keep hammering in throughout this presentation. I think, you know, you can't optimize for something, you can't advocate for budget internally if you can't measure and point to results. So. Uh, the, the ability to really measure that your influencer marketing program and some of your organic brand affinity is really creating that value for you down the funnel, I think is one of the most important and the hardest things that, that marketers are facing right now, is just really putting a dollar value on all of these investments they're making uh, to build their brand uh, across these influential networks. Yeah, definitely. Um... Well, and, you know, when we're talking about about measuring it, um, I think a piece of the measuring and what we found, the reason why we came up with um, this uh, segment management funnel is saying, OK, well, if we're able to bring this audience in and maybe they don't immediately go to a conversion point or maybe they do and you want them to convert again in some capacity. If you're an e-commerce store and you put them down a specific um, you know, funnel and you, they are purchasing dresses and you want them to purchase shoes as well. If you're a B2B client and you have them at an event and they have not converted to an actual deal or maybe they're in the pipeline uh, for your sales team, being able to actually manage them from a social perspective is, is something that we have heard from our customers as a pain point. Um, and to tackle that, what we built is um, this this segment uh, segment audience funnel, which gives you an idea of where your audience is um, in, this, in the funnel. So this is everywhere from discovered, they had never heard of you before, and you're able to um, build out content that is really high level, giving them an idea about maybe your industry versus specifically about your company, um, and then kind of moving them down to being more aware. They've engaged with uh, they maybe looked at some of your content, casually engaged, maybe they just retweeted it, um, heavy engaged, maybe they responded to something that you put out there. And then really your advocates that that care about your brand, that are super engaged, um, and that then the content there is going to be very different. If it's from a B2B perspective, it's, you know, sending them to the pricing page or, hey, do you have interest in, you know, actually attending this webinar? Um from a B2C perspective, we've seen everything from offering a coupon or um, actually getting them um, into a store and offering them an incentive there. Um, so there's a lot of different ways from a measurement perspective um, to get them to the conversion point, making sure that you're being thoughtful about um, sort of that nurturing um, uh, of the relationship, which is super, uh, which is very important. And we're, we're seeing customers really needing that uh, more and more. Um, and, you know, as we talked about before, being able to really track that and say, OK, where are my influencers? Where are my audiences moving down the funnel? And 
what we've also seen and from a content perspective is saying, okay, here's one audience. I'm going to share them on this content. Here's another audience. I'm going to share this content and let's measure the success of this. Is it working? Is it not working? Um, hey, if it is working, maybe we should put them in a, a segment and show them some ads um, and being able to, to optimize that to continue that nurturing process down to an actual conversion point. So, um, Kara, have you seen this from uh, how important do you feel that really nurturing those relationships um, to point of conversion um, is? And have you seen, you know, success with that from, from your side? Yeah, I think what's, what's interesting about this and really breaking out of the funnel stage is we've actually seen this with a lot of our customers where they're actually reorganizing their entire marketing teams. You know, instead of being around, you know, specialization focus, so you have your social media team and your email team, uh, they're actually breaking up their team instead into uh, into more of a funnel-focused uh, structure. We've been seeing this happen more and more with our with our customers uh, as as digital has become more pervasive across all the different stages of the funnel. So, uh, to your point, Hillary, I mean, it's incredibly important that the people at the top of the funnel are getting a, a far different message and a different type of touch than the people that are farther down. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's one thing we've seen just even structurally the way this is kind of like permeating across marketing teams is it's really just changing the way we think about how we're organizing ourselves because. You know, it's much it's it's much more important to get the message at each stage correct rather than just getting social media period correct and yeah. and as we get more omnichannel and get more holistic in the way we're marketing I think that funnel stage organization becomes much more important right definitely and you know I think what what brands are really seeing is okay now I'm able to see if this audience is if it's even a successful audience because if they're not moving down the funnel then this audience isn't correct right mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's been it's been very interesting to kind of see that transition. Um, so now that we're kind of kind of talked about the identification piece and sort of how to to start nurturing those relationships. Um, so once you get them to the bottom of the funnel, what does that you know success look like? Um, we have some some metrics that from a social perspective that we that we measure. Um, and then Kara, I know you have you have some metrics that TrackMaven also helps clients with, which we're excited to hear about. Um, but from a social side. What we're really seeing is uh, we have an, an insights section of our, our platform, so you're able to really uh, get an idea of what audiences um, and what content's working, and being able to see the engagement rates, which is uh, it's a it's a big metric because you want to see if people actually care about your brand, actually care about your content. Are they engaging with it? Um, so this was actually a, a Twitter campaign that we ran for one of our clients, um, and we saw. Uh, influencers liking, retweeting, replying to the message. And um, even with, with the numbers um, a bit smaller on, on likes or clicks, what we're having to, to really give a better understanding to, um, to, our, to our brands is saying, these are actual influencers that have incredible reach. So one retweet, we're, we're doing a campaign for um, Rare Country, which um, they're doing a big country music awards. And one of their um, their tweets actually got retweeted by a Rascal Flatts. Um, and it was super exciting for them because just that one tweet um, just blew up their their reach. Um, and having, you know, a thousand of those or, you know, 500 retweets is going to make a difference when you're looking at your engagement rates on really how active people are on on um, your content. And the great part is, is being able to activate even a smaller audience that's very hyper relevant to you, you're going to see those kind of results. Um, additionally, of course, is is the metric around around click rates. And we really say this is the number of clicks by how many people we've activated. Um, and so as always, driving traffic to a site, being able to have a conversion point. Um, and what we usually recommend is actually saying, let's look at the engagement funnel. Let's first start the conversation with your audience and this identified influencer audience like you would if you just met somebody on the uh, on the street or at a bar or a friend of a friend, you're not going to go up to them and say, hey, can you, you know, buy me a drink or hey, can do you want to, you know, purchase this dress? I mean, you're not going to go straight up to them and ask them uh, for something before they even know who you are. Um, you're going to say, uh, you know, something relatable. You're going to try to try to connect with them in a more authentic way. And brands need to remember to actually get the conversion point, you have to first build that relationship. Um, so with these metrics in mind, we there's also an education piece of being able to to really re-educate marketers to say, we understand that it takes 
uh, that you, you need these immediate metrics, but it takes time to also nurture relationships like in real life. Um, and that's how social is. Social is real people that are on the other side of that tweet and making sure you're thoughtful about the approach is, is just really important. Um, yeah, Hazard, I just want to chime in quickly there. I, I think that the, the education comment you made is, is, is hugely important. And kind of the way we try to think about it at, at Track Maven is this, uh, there's just been this pendulum swing, I think, from people moving away from en engagement towards like being very strict about ROI. And if, if you can't measure ROI, that's all you should care about. And if you can't measure ROI, it doesn't matter. Right. And we're actually of the mind at Track Maven that you, you have to use both. You have to, you can't just like ignore engagement metrics or what we call leading metrics, or just people engaging with your content on social, people, you know, engaging with their website. These like really early uh, metrics that show audience engagement. Uh, because that is that is the only way you can drive towards long-term ROI is if you're getting those initial leading metrics. And uh, you know ROI takes a long time to measure, especially if you're in a, a long sale B2B business. So you're getting those those proxy metrics at the top of the funnel to see just am I getting the response I'm looking for from the people I'm trying to engage? I think is hugely important. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean that is. And like you said, with that shift in, in marketing mindset, um, especially in the B2B space, you know, on, on lead gen and, and specific metrics around, um, you know, conversion points, it, it, if you don't have the audience, then you'll never get the sale at the end of the day. Um, so making sure that you're actually building those audiences when you do have a pul like a pulse campaign or, or a campaign where you're nurturing them um, when they are ready to buy they're thinking about you and they're not thinking about you in a way of, Oh, they really annoyed me with a bunch of content that didn't make sense for me. Um, there was more of like, Oh, I remember having a really good conversation about, you know, earn versus paid, uh, marketing. I learned something, maybe they are an expert in the field. Um, and I'm sure from a content perspective, that's, that's something that's very important to you. I'm being a thought leader in that space. So the touch point is more organic. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we're talking about, uh, you know, the strategies and the different types of campaigns, and this is definitely something, um, Kara, that I want your perspective on as well. Um, what we've really been seeing with our customers is making sure that you have a good, um, you know, mix of pulse campaigns, which are these one-off campaigns that we all have, you know, a major Black Friday promotion, um, you know, a product launch of sorts, uh, campaign specific, a webinar, um, something that has a timestamp on it that it has a sense of urgency that you need an audience to activate quickly. Um, and that, and that really brings in a lot of net new audiences that brings in a lot of, um, new interest. Um, but making sure that that's also tied with something called an always on campaign um, in the B2B space. This will be a, um, a nurture track that you have in your marketing automation um, for a B2C company. This is everything from um, your, your basic newsletters to um, any sort of continued uh, marketing materials that you share with them, um, customer marketing, making sure your customers are always up to date on anything new that's coming out from you. Um, and this is, and this is really to give, um, your audiences enough um, information and enough, uh, you know, campaigns, uh, authentic campaigns that you're making sure that it's tied to your your overarching strategy. Um, so, Kara, I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts around this. I know you guys are are kind of on the the overarching understanding of campaigns as a whole. Um, I'd love to kind of hear your perspective there. Yeah. So, I, like I mentioned a little bit at the beginning, we really our our platform centralizes all of your marketing channels in one place so that you can understand how your activities work together to get results. And I think that's something that, again, with that kind of team silo structure, when you when you silo your team by by functionality, like here's social and here's events and here's my webinar team, um, that that kind of gets lost in a shuffle uh, where what you really need to see is how all these activities really tie together and ultimately drive people someone down, farther down funnel. So I think uh, really holistically, this is an interesting way to think about it for sure because there are both top of funnel and bottom of funnel elements to all of these different types of campaigns. You know, you could host a big user conference that is maybe more top of funnel to drive some referrals, uh, or you could drive a really, you could create a really small event uh, with a, a few targeted, you know, a uh, few targeted buyer personas in a specific city, a really tight audience uh, that is that is farther down funnel. Uh, so I think there are top and bottom of funnel elements to all of these with social again too. You could have just really top of funnel brand awareness type campaigns uh, and you could get much farther down funnel with some some ad retargeting to people who have visited your website. So I think adding another layer of, strat layer of stratification to, you know, you have always on elements for sure, and then you do have these uh, these these lower funnel campaigns that are much, much more, more targeted. So 
uh, I like the structure and, and again, and layering the funnel stages on top of it to know when you can be hitting each, each funnel stage. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, you know, so when we're kind of talking about, you know, uh, measurement success for, um, for your team, love to hear a little bit more on, on track mavens, um, you know, perspective on how you measure success for social influence. For sure. So, uh, like I like I mentioned uh, previously uh, at the top of the of the show today, we really hey Kara, I think uh, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Are you there? any marketing cares about and and an influencer marketing program is no different and marketing teams prove the impact across their social media their ad networks email blog earned media uh, you, you name it so for the purposes today of course I want to zero in on some uh, some ways to measure the value of your organic influence which like we talked about just briefly is this proxy metric for your brand affinity it's a leading metric it's a proxy metric for your ultimate ROI because like Hillary said if you don't have the audience to begin with you won't drive the sales at all so there are a couple of ways that we suggest that marketing teams measure the, the value of their programs. And first and foremost is using a share of interactions report, which is what you're looking at on this current slide. And a, a share of interactions report helps you learn how engaging your brand is in absolute terms by taking your engagement versus all of your competitors and your industry leaders to see what percentage of the total engagement on any particular channel you own. So, in this example, uh, which I pulled from our platform, we're looking at the share of interactions on Facebook across the last 30 days uh, between a few of the leading outdoor apparel brands. So uh, it's Arcteryx in orange, Columbia in teal, Marmot in purple, Patagonia is in light green, and REI is in dark green. And then finally, the North Face is down at the bottom in yellow. And now again, this is, this is from the last 30 days, which of course was a really high traffic e-commerce season. Season. We had both Black Friday and Cyber Monday in this period. So what should become really obvious to you right away off the bat in this, in this share of interactions report is that REI in that dark green really dominated the share of interactions on Facebook across this entire period. And when we take a closer look and actually dug into the content that was driving this, all of this share of interactions, uh, we can see why. So this post on the right hand side, uh, you can see that as they did last year, REI made this major play around their opt outside campaign, which, uh, you know, they, they closed their doors on Black Friday and really encouraged their audience to get outdoors instead of waiting in line outside of a retail store to shop. So it's a major branding play that they, they launched for the first time last year and have did in a bigger way this year. And it's a really major audience engagement and brand affinity play for them. Uh, so again, they encourage their entire audience to get outside and engage with the hashtag opt outside uh, to share pictures of them climbing mountains instead of shopping. Uh, and they get this huge surge in, in influence across all of their social networks. And a lot of, of outdoor influencers chime in and engage with this campaign too. And REI has of course done a really good job of building out their own influencer network uh, with a lot of climbers and sport fanatics and, and, and the various sports that they create gear for. So you can see in this thank you post on their Facebook page on the right that REI had over 6 million people participate in their opt outside campaign this year. Uh, and this thank you post had, had a huge influence. It had thousands of reactions and shares. So a really influential campaign for them. So the value of this share of interaction report is this. If, if, if you can really clearly see what percentage of the conversation on any channel your brand owns. And if I were the REI marketing team and I was in charge of this opt outside campaign, I would use the share of interactions report to show that not only was this campaign hugely successful just from an audience participation standpoint, but it also really effectively drowned out all of our, the, our other competitors across this period. You know, they really just owned Facebook, essentially. For anyone who was engaging in any sort of outdoor, uh, looking for any sort of outdoor uh, equipment during this period, uh, REI was everywhere you looked on Facebook. So they really effectively drowned out their competition. And I think that's the real value of a share of interaction support like this is, you know, social media marketers and, and content marketers have struggled for a long time to prove their value in the C-suite. And while the C-suite may never understand social media tacitly, they do understand what it means to, you know, beat the crap out of the competition, quite frankly. So that is where a share of inter interactions graph like this becomes so impactful. Um, and Hillary, if you can go ahead and flip to the next slide, uh, I want to point out too that 
you don't have to do share of interactions graph just on a, a particular social channel. You can do them across any part of your marketing mix, uh, even with earned media mentions. Uh, since you know we are talking about some some influencer marketing, I think earned media can be a cool way to see how your brand is being picked up by the press and and other influential outlets. So. Something I thought was really interesting that I wanted to share here is when I pulled uh, another share of interactions report, and this one is looking at earned media mentions across the same time period in the same mix of brands, we actually get a totally different picture. It's actually Patagonia in the light green that was really dominant across this period and actually kind of outperformed REI, the dark green, and, and the North Face had a few spikes in yellow at the bottom. But it was Patagonia uh, that was actually pretty dominant, dominant from an earned media mention perspective across the same time period. And they did it in a really interesting way. They actually did it by taking on Black Friday and uh, REI's Opt Outside campaign head on. So Patagonia announced that rather than closing their stores on Black Friday like REI does, what they decided to do was actually donate all of their proceeds from Black Friday to charity. So this was a major PR play that was in direct response to the Opt Outside campaign. And while from the previous slide we saw that it didn't get as much of the organic influence and interaction on, on Facebook and their social networks, it really did get a huge amount of mentions and, and a lot of influence uh, from, from a lot of press outlets. So if you go ahead and, and, and flip over to the next slide, we can see that this mention from CNN Money in particular uh, drove a ton of engagement and a lot of buzz about Patagonia. We can see in the right-hand corner there's this 365.46x number, uh, and that marker it's a, it's a track of impact score. And what that means is that this this mention of Patagonia in CNN Money drove 367 times more social interactions than Patagonia's average press mention. So that is huge for them. And and you can see kind of the bulk of the shares in this article came on Facebook. So on the right, CNN Money shared out the article themselves on their Facebook page, so it got a lot of exposure for Patagonia to the CNN Money audience, as well as a lot, a, a huge number of other uh, press outlets that kind of picked up on this 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 PR campaign from P Patagonia. And I think this this the share of interactions report really proves that value. So an, another thing that we look at, you know, I mentioned that you know beyond these top of funnel interactions that uh, we really try and prioritize tying activities to business outcomes. And we recommend that marketing teams measure this using a few key metrics. So if you want to prove that brand building and building a community and an influencer network are really valuable to you, then I think you have to be able to put a dollar sign on it, uh, like Hillary alluded to at the beginning with, with some of those clicks and conversion rates. And we do that as well with our clients at TrackMaven. I think first and foremost, you have to tie these engagement metrics to revenue, to those business outcomes. And you have to really go beyond, in addition to these, these top of funnel metrics, uh, and prove your impact by investing in the activities that drive the key conversions and sales that you care about. So if you're in an e-commerce business, for example, and an influencer tweets a link to a product of yours, you need be able to be able to see that you know that retweet uh, drove to X amount of web traffic, X amount of conversions, and ultimately to X amount of sales. So it really puts a dollar value uh, on the engagement that you got from that influencer. And the cool thing about this is that it doesn't have to be solely e-commerce focused, of course. Uh, the beauty of having kind of omni-channel integrations with uh, Google Analytics and HubSpot and Marketo and Salesforce all in one place, which we have in the TrackMaven platform, is that you can actually measure the impact of your social media marketing and your earned media, uh, as well as your email and your blog uh, content, uh, based on all the results that, that your business cares about. So, that could be that you care about newsletter signups, or you care about app downloads, or uh, if you're more on the B2B side of the business, do you really care more about you know driving SALs and MQLs and opportunities? Uh, in which case, you know it, it's great if you get traffic, but if that traffic isn't converting, uh, then that's really not driving the results that you care about. So, yeah, one of the things we we do with our dashboard here. Sorry, go ahead, Hillary. No, no, no. I was just gonna say, um, it just seems that also that you know to measure success, you can't just be siloed with your measurement. Uh, it seems that you have to be looking at it as a whole to say, okay, to meet this goal, these are the different um, you know, areas that I need to be making sure I'm measuring because audiences don't live on one channel or one center of you know. Somebody that's on newsletter might not be on social, or might they might be on both, and making sure that you know you're tying your success across the board for your audience. Totally, and and you know if you're and another important note there too is to make sure you're not you know attributing every touch point uh, 
you're not double counting all of these touch points, that you're really doing kind of like a multi-touch attribution process, so you can see uh, the true value of each of those touch points uh, from, as this kind of the sum of their parts. So in other words, like you can compare performance across all of your digital channels uh, in one place. So in this example, I think you can see in the graph, social media is actually driving most of the web traffic and goal completions and revenue for, for this client in particular. So if I was in the social media team, uh, this would actually be a case to maybe get a little bit more budget for my team to really continue the work that we're doing uh, in the, our social media marketing efforts. But you're right, Hillary, having that kind of holistic view uh, is, is hugely important to make sure that you're, you're, you're pulling audiences on all the different channels that they're active on. Right, definitely. So to turn over to a couple of quick best practices, I'll share a couple from my end, and then Hillary will chime in, uh, please, as well, as, as you see fit. I think... Uh, one of the most important things is now that we've covered a few of these measurement options, you know, measurement is great. Being able to put a put a put a number on your influence is incredibly important. But what's great about measurement is it, it is the foundation for optimization. So you can't optimize what you can't measure. So we know how to measure now. So let's move on into how we can optimize. I think the first real best practice uh, is to understand when when less is actually more. And I've seen this as a huge trend ac across the content marketing landscape, where I think we've kind of over index, you know, content marketing became a thing and social media marketing, and now we're all in on it. And we almost need to, most brands need to pull back nowadays. So um, I just spoke about measuring the hard ROI of your marketing and the form of, you know, web traffic and conversions revenue. But where things get really, really cool is if you can re examine what's driving those results, kind of work backwards and really get more results with less effort. So in this example, you can see on the graph on the right hand side, we're actually looking at the total number of Facebook posts versus web traffic sessions. The Facebook post is orange and the web traffic sessions, the referral traffic from Facebook is in blue. So ideally, if you can pinpoint the content that is actually driving people to your website from Facebook, you, could, you can post less often and really drive more results with, with less activity. So it really cuts out a lot of a wasted effort from your social or your content or your influencer team if you can kind of trim the fat, so to speak, and really just see, okay, when in these influencers tweet, we get this referral traffic, or when we post these posts, this, these types of campaign or content, we get these results, and cut out everything else that really isn't driving the results you care about. So ideally what you'd see is that orange bar, your Facebook post going down, uh, and your referral traffic from Facebook shooting upwards. And so that's where you can really get really granular and try and drive more with less uh, less effort from your team side. Right. And I and I know this is a good lead into the next slide, but I I would 100% agree with that, especially with having um you know a lot of companies have very lean marketing teams and you know producing uh really great results from less effort and money because marketing's always the one that spends all the money. Um, <laughs> being able to have that tied to success that um you know a higher level of success with less effort is always the the goal, right? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, especially with influencer, I think a lot of the, the, the brands that we work with, um, they may have, a, you know, a blogger program. And what's cool that they can do is they can actually go in, and I, Hillary, your, your platform may help with this as well, is you could go in and see, okay, when this person writes something for us, you know, what is the average impact versus all these other, you know, influencer bloggers. And so you can really clearly see and kind of almost gamify the system and say, like, look, when this influencer writes for us, the blog posts get more social shares, they get more web traffic and more conversions. Uh, so let's double down on our relationship with this influencer and really engage with them across more channels because clearly whatever message and uh, audience they already have built in, it's working for us. Right, yeah, definitely. And we're, we're seeing that, um, you know, tied to, to everyone from a an influencer with, you know, millions of followers to an influencer with only a few thousand. If you're able mm -hmm. to target that audience, it's amazing to see what the reach looks like because it's so hyper-focused and hyper-tuned in to saying they have influence in this area that we care about, um, having this audience, even if it's maybe, you know, 20 of these micro-influencers have even a larger audience than somebody that has a million followers that maybe don't have as much um, relevancy to your brand. For sure, that relevancy and specificity uh, can be much more valuable than just a big bulk blast audience, for sure. Yeah. So that's a really important distinction. Um, which kind of ties to the second kind of best practice, which is, of course, around optimizing your budget. Uh, I think with TrackMaven, um, one thing that's cool that we can do is um, we have the ability to actually detect when your competitors are putting money behind a post or not. So, you know, if we thought back to that REI example of uh, their opt-outside campaign, 
you could actually jump in and see, you know, like, oh, okay, are they promoting this? And that's why it's, it had such a big influence on Facebook? Or is this purely just a hugely successful organic campaign? And, and having that competitive insight to say, you know, this competitor is putting money behind it or not, it is one level of value because it lets you kind of calibrate your strategy and prevent you from, say, uh, getting into uh, a promotion war with your competitors where you're both just pumping money out behind everything uh, and just blasting spam out your audience. But I think even more importantly, and Hillary, I'm sure you can speak to this too, but um, from an efficiency standpoint for your own content creation, you can actually see which of your content is performing well organically and then go back and put budget or promotion behind those posts that are already organically performing well. So that kind of taps back to Hillary, what you were saying earlier about this difference between paid and, and this earned influence. And I think when you can, you can really measure that earned organic influence and then put promotion behind it, that's where like you get really powerful results. Definitely. And we've seen, and we've seen that time and time again, um, brands really looking and identifying, you know, marketing campaigns that are working or not working. And actually we've had some that had a huge campaign and budget behind a can, uh, you know, a, an initiative and then they ran it organically and it, and it just didn't work like they wanted it to. So they made the decision not to spend the money on it, um, you know, and to kind of restructure it and think through something that, that maybe resonates better with their audience. So it definitely kind of helps to your point, uh, make sure that that spend is going somewhere that's, that's actually going to make a difference. For sure, and I think it's a little bit dangerous too when you're, you're just promoting, putting money behind all of your content because you're artificially making it look like your content is working and you're losing that ability to see like, do people actually care about this or was it just put enough money behind it that I got a little bit of a, a interactions and I kind of created this self-fulfilling prophecy that now I'm getting the results I wanted because I put enough money behind it. So right. be able to peel back that layer and see like what was organic, what worked well organically, then what worked well paid and you know how can I calibrate between the two I think is hugely important. Definitely. So kind of the third thing uh, and best practice that has been kind of a through line to this whole session is, is the ability to tie it all together. So uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, finding this big picture and measuring the results from all of your channels and your marketing mix against one another and really seeing where you can save some money, where you can get a little bit more efficient. Uh, and you really need to go a step further and get really, really granular. Uh, you can really click down to the post level. So if you do want to optimize every piece of content that you're you know, putting time and energy into creating, then you need a way to tie every single post to business results. So from a web engagement standpoint, that means you need to be able to see what we're seeing here in this example uh, from a client, an invented client. Uh, I didn't want to use a, a real customer's data. So this is an invented client. Uh, on a Facebook post, but you can actually see uh, down at the bottom that from a web engagement standpoint, how much uh, goal conversions did this individual Facebook post drive? You know, did this individual Facebook post get people to sign up for my newsletter or fill out a key form on my website? So in this first example, uh, we can see that this Facebook post, post actually drove half of the total page views uh, to the web page that this Facebook post was promoting, uh, and that people who came to this web page from this Facebook post uh, actually converted at twice the rate, at 66% versus 33% conversion rate. Uh, so people who were coming from this Facebook post to that web page actually filled out a key form or signed up for a net newsletter, whatever that conversion was, um, but they're converting at twice the rate. So again, from that organic and then uh, putting paid money behind organic uh, results that are already there, this is a huge opportunity because if I saw this, I'd immediately go put budget behind this post. Right. Because it's really clear that it's getting me the results I care about. It's getting people to convert at twice the rate of the page overall. And, uh, you know, this post-level analysis is huge because it allows you to really comb through every piece of content you're creating and understand its business value. So you do more of what's working and less of what's not moving the needle for you. Uh, quickly on the B2B side, uh, or from the funnel kind of analytics perspective, on the right-hand side is a couple of examples. Uh, actually using TrackMan's own data from our, our, our funnel analytics uh, capabilities. So you can actually do this from a B2B standpoint as well and see how does individual blog posts or Facebook posts convert to MQLs and SALs and opportunities and even down to closed deals. So you can really see, you know, what are the dependencies? Do people read this Facebook post, then convert to my website, uh, and then ultimately end up in closed business? So you can get this post level analysis to put, put real business value on everything you're putting out to market. Yeah. I think that that's I mean, when we talk ROI and, and sort of connecting all of that together, it's it's sort of the uh, the the best case scenario on being able to directly tie your your initiatives to to that metric, which is 
incredibly important. Um, and actually we got a few questions that came in. Um, and Bailey, I think, you know, you have, you have a few questions came in from social. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with a few questions. Um, one that came in was, where do you see brands going wrong in influencer marketing? Like, do you see any of your customers making common mistakes? Um, Kara, I can, I can kind of kick that one off and then, and then sure. pass it to you. Um, you know, I think where we've seen, um, clients kind of uh, having a difficult time is, is, you know, first the identification piece, even on the paid side, you know, they're identifying paid influencers that they think would be a good strategy for them. And sometimes, um, their audience just doesn't resonate with, with the content or the initiative that the brand is doing. Um, we also have seen, um, you know, not being as thoughtful about who their micro influencers are and making sure we they find out the audiences that are a bit on that lower level um, of, of traction, but also have the, the higher engagement, have the audiences that really care about the topic. And then their approach being more authentic than just kind of, you know, blasting out content that doesn't resonate. So that's kind of what we've been seeing on, on sort of the struggle uh, on both sides and, and just making sure that brands are kind of reeducating themselves about you know, what that process looks like. I don't know, Kara, if you have any, any insight into that. Yeah, I'll, I'll double down on your point, Hillary, which is that the, the targeting has to come first and foremost. If you're not tapping into the right influencers, then you're wasting a lot of time and energy, you know, getting your name in front of the wrong people. So that is for sure. I agree with everything Hillary just said about, about that getting that targeting right first and foremost. I think another thing that people uh, miss the boat on sometimes with influencer marketing, and Hillary, you might agree or disagree, is, is they overlook the power of customers as influencers. Um, and that's something we've seen, you know, particularly on maybe a more, well, it works on both the B2B and the B2C side. Uh, if you can really get your customers to, to then become advocates for you, they can be your biggest influencer. So, you know, an influencer doesn't have to mean someone who's a big thought leader in the space. It can just be someone who really likes you and your brand and is willing to advocate for you. Yeah, I mean, I hundred percent. It's it's the whole idea of turning your influencers into customers and customers into advocates. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's the goal to keep to keep traction um, around your brand and content. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Kara, you you just mentioned that that's a great strategy for both B two B and B two C brands. Um, can you go a little bit more into any tips that you have or anything that you've noticed with your own customers about? The, the different ways that, that influencer marketing might look for a B2B brand as opposed to B2C? Yeah, I think the traditional way uh, on the B2B side uh, is particularly through this you know, case study type approach um, in using your customers to become influencers. Um, I think another thing that's really interesting on the B2B side, uh, and I think Thomas Tungus, who, who has a blog, uh, he's a capitalist, a venture capitalist at Redpoint Ventures, he wrote this great piece uh, that you can find if you just search like Thomas Tungus, why is demand generation so hard? Uh, and this whole piece was basically that for B2B businesses, you have this early adoption with some self-educators in your space. You know, these B2B, B2B sales are typically more complex. They take a lot more time. And uh, you get an early surge in demand gen where those people who are self-educating and they know they ha have a problem that you solve and great, things look good. But then you get into this point where uh, you, you have to reach this kind of like fattest part of, of your addressable market. They really demand a lot more education and a lot more hand-holding and a lot more social proof uh, through case studies and references um, to, to get them to that point of purchase, to get them comfortable with the purchase point. So I think on the B2B side, uh, an area where we see a lot of people going awry is really kind of overthinking this influencer and thought leadership component where they think it has to be high-minded and super dry and esoteric. Uh, and what we've seen a couple of, of, of brands do a really great job with influencer marketing is just finding people that can really speak your audience's language. So you don't have to go to a, you know, we had a customer who was in the pharmaceutical industry and they decided rather than, you know, talking uh, at a really high level uh, around some of the concerns of their laboratorians that they worked with, they really just cut to the more human element uh, and talk to a lot of uh, leading researchers in the space about really human concerns, like how do I get budget for my research projects? They really just cut down to the human element. And I think if you engage with influencers uh, on that more human component and the emotional component, uh, uh, on the B2B side, I think that's where I see some people going awry. So you think it has to be high-minded, uh, but it can really be a more human element. Um, and I think on the B2C side, uh, one of the things that I've seen, one brand that I think does just a really incredible job of this is um, 
uh, in the e-commerce space is, is MyFitnessPal uh, and also J. Crew. And I think the same thing applies, it just it surfaces in a different way. So MyFitnessPal actually did this incredible job of talking to people who are trying to lose weight, uh, which obviously is their entire addressable audience. Uh, and they really talked to them at a really human level about what their struggles were, you know, why you sign up for a workout program and then fall off the wagon. Uh, and they just turned that into really human language and, and talking with turned average people into influencers by giving them a voice. Uh, and that's been something that I've seen some really innovative work done on the B2C side. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Okay, well, we have one last question. Um, just where where do you, as a content marketer, see influencer marketing going in 2017? Like, what changes do you predict? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I mean, I think that the education point that I, we just talked about is, is a huge part of it. Uh, because if you're in the business of, of selling your company and promoting, as we all are, uh, you can get into this trap uh, where if you're in the business of selling promotions, that many businesses value continuity over innovation. So I think holding on to this more, 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 con more consistent messaging uh, with your influencers can be a, a really important thing to, to make hold of and not get too, too thrown off track with trying to go with the latest and greatest technology or the latest and greatest uh, in any particular channel. But really trying to drive home this human and, and common uh, really human and accessible messaging through your influencers. I think more and more people will be finding ways to, uh, to, to lift up just individual customers and give them a voice as influencers. Yeah, that's interesting, that's great. Um, yeah, and uh, I think too, Kara, I mean, with that whole idea on like authenticity and you know talking about being able to you know uh, interact with customers on more of that human to human approach, I think now brands are really finding that they have to be that way because I think customers, and I'm sure you'll you've seen this too, or just anybody really that's even on, especially on social. They're becoming a, a much more, uh, they're smarter, they want more from brands, and the expectation is higher to say, okay, you know, you, you're you sounding really like a robot, or we don't really care what you have to say. Um, like, we want a real person, you know, answering our tweets, and they care about us, and they really want to hear what we have to say. And I think that's forcing now brands to be more authentic because, you know, audiences just aren't buying it anymore. For sure, and I think that actually brings up an interesting point too, where where influencer marketing can get kind of even more interesting. Is I think people are willing to give up their information and you know fill out forms with brands so long as they can get something in return out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a lot of research done with things like Spotify, where people are willing to you know let their data be processed so long as they get better predictions and recommendations from you know. In the, in the Spotify example, now you have you know we discover weekly where you have a curated playlist. So as long as you're providing more value and return, uh, and and potentially using in some influencers to uh, kind of help curate a process, I think that could be an interesting way that influencer marketing uh, gets into this whole curation uh, trend that we're seeing from a lot of marketing programs. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks, Kara, and thanks, Track Maven, for. Uh joining us today in our webinar. Um, next up, we're gonna have Joseph Cole from Tap Influence talking about paid and earned influencer marketing. And he, he'll be coming from a paid influencer marketing platform perspective, which is interesting because that's pretty much the opposite of what we do at Insightful. So he'll be having an interesting conversation with our CEO, Devin, about that, if anyone wants to join that. Um, but yeah, thanks, Kara. Thanks, Kara, today. appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak with you all and, and talk with the Insight Pool audience. All right, awesome. Thanks. Thank you.